Hello and welcome to the Beauty Chronicles. I'm Meredith Jones, a professor of gender studies who loves popular culture. And I'm Carla, Meredith's trusty sidekick. In these Beauty Chronicles, we discuss all sorts of fascinating and sometimes grotesque things to do with cosmetic surgery, media, popular culture, celebrity, and much more. Today, we're going to talk about Ozempic and the Ozempic face. This is going to take us on a journey through fatness and thinness, changing beauty standards, the origins of the BMI, and racism which rears its ugly head in relation to so many so-called beauty standards and beauty debates. So, so, Zempic. Oh, Zempic, yeah. I've been on an, a Zempic trip the last few days doing some research for this. Um, and I've realised that really Ozempic is kind of the tip of the current iceberg of what we can call fat phobia. Um, and before we talk about Ozempic and the Ozempic face and what might be called the contemporary kind of new thin, that's in quotation marks, we really have to uh, talk about history. Um, so we have a cultural memory. And when I say we, I, you know, I'm broadly speaking about Western uh, contemporary cultures. We do have this cultural sort of memory or knowledge um, that sometime, maybe in the Renaissance, the most beautiful, ideal women's bodies were voluptuous, curvaceous, rounded, even what might be called nowadays uh, fat, if not if not maybe just plump. Um, we do know less about older men's bodily ideals, and that's because of the history of art, which is a whole other story. And feminist art historians will, you know, have done, and feminist artists have done a lot to explain why there are so many more depictions of women's bodies than men's bodies. Uh, and that's to do with who wanted to paint what. Basically, cis men like to paint nude women, <laughs> you know, it comes down to that. Um, Orlan is fantastic on that. We might do a podcast about her in the future. Hannah Gadsby's fantastic about that. Um, thank you, Hannah Gadsby, for everything you do. Um, so Rubens is probably the most famous of these Renaissance painters. Um, and actually, he did paint a lot of men. Um, and his men tend to be very muscular, quite big and very muscular. But if we look at a painting uh, of one of Rubens' paintings, perhaps the one called The Judgment of Paris, uh, we can see that the women he paints are covered in cellulite. Um, they're kind of lumpy looking by today's standards uh, and they're very, very rounded. Um, so, and these were, these sorts of bodies were painted over and over again uh, to represent goddesses, to represent great beauty. So they they were clearly the ideal um, of the time. So if we just leave that as that, then what we need to look at is why and how did that change? How did we come to a current fat phobic society that glorifies thinness, really the thinner the better? And we are still in that state, no matter how many small changes we, we work upon. And there are actually several ways that historians of the body and especially feminist historians of the body or feminist historians who focus on the body have explained this. Um, and I've looked at some of them this week and and one of the most interesting, perhaps the most interesting one, I think, is the work by this amazing historian called Sabrina Strings. And her book, published in 2019, is called Fearing the Black Body, 
the racial origins of fat phobia. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. I can only really touch on it very lightly here, but it is an, an incredible book. Um, very, very highly recommended. It's also readable, which is wonderful. So one of the things Strings does is she gives us a history of Western changing attitudes to fat, that is fat on bodies and particularly on women's bodies, um, from the good old Renaissance a la Rubens to the present, although not exactly the present because, you know, we're talking about at least five years ago. And of course, things, especially in popular culture, can change quite, quite quickly. String's aim is to show that the current very much accepted part of mainstream culture, fat phobia, um, that we also re refer to as the obesity pandemic, is based in racism and has its origins in the slave slave trade. Now, I guess I, I guess I kind of knew this, but. I'd never really delved into it, and I certainly had no idea of the kind of details that that Strings gives us. So it's it's just such a good book. I you know, as I said, can't recommend it highly enough. Basically, she shows us that the modern hatred of fat came about because slavers needed to distinguish themselves from the people that they were kidnapping, transporting, selling and putting to work for no money. Um, in order to justify slavery, we had to invent a fundamental difference between people with more sallow or pale skins and complexions and people with more brown and dark complexions. That, that, dis that distinguishment, if you like, had to be invented and it was invented, and you'd think that that might be enough, that suddenly there was this invention of that kind of dark skin equals animalistic, therefore uh, a dark-skinned person, we can justify that they can be owned, that they can be put to work like an animal. Yeah, this is specifically European culture. Yes, it's specifically the old... European slave trade. I'm not talking about contemporary slave traders. Or other other exactly. slave traders, the Ottomans or the Egyptians or the Exactly. You know. I'm talking about the slave trade that then went on to create the current fat phobic white culture that is predominantly predominantly comes out of the US and Europe and spreads itself around the world. So it's really leading up to that, this contemporary moment uh, from those particular geogra geographic um, places. Now, unfortunately, skin colour turned out not to be enough, surprise, surprise, to actually justify slavery, especially because at this time we were seeing um, the growths of anatomical disciplines. We were We were finding out that once the skin is gone, the bodies are the same, right? So other measures became necessary to dis to make basically to make slavery um, acceptable. And one of them, only one of them, was related to body size. And what Sabrina String shows is how gradually with the work of anthropologists, so-called naturalists, eugenicists, and indeed artists, Rubens curvy women were replaced. So remember these curvy women were ideal women, ideal white women. Those ideal women were gradually replaced by super pale, very thin uh, white women in paintings throughout the 19th century and then that carried into 20th century photography and now into 21st century photography, popular culture and all of the rest. The ideal person became white, slim, of course he was male, he was educated and he was middle or upper class and he was 
therefore allowed to own people who were other to that. Um, the ideal black woman, the ideal black woman who was a slave, was necessarily robust. She had to be strong enough to carry out the most hard labour, right? She was a worker, but the ideal white woman had to be, in a way, the opposite. So while the ideal black woman remained strong, muscular, with a certain level of healthy fat, the ideal, sorry, did I say white woman? Anyway, that was the ideal black woman. The ideal white woman had to become a pretty ornament. So the ideal white woman got steadily smaller. Yeah. And in a way, you you know, you could say that both white and black women were owned by white men at this time. And, and in no way, though, do I want to um, parallel white women's experience with black women. I totally, you know, will, um, you know, absolutely argue that the advantages of being white, no matter what your gender, are still always you know, very, very, very much there. So, are, there yeah. are there examples of, of art in the, uh, did you say 19th century? Like, yes. So yes, Strings gives a, many, many examples of the ways that um, uh, Enlightenment artists stopped painting women like Rubens women and started their women in their paintings started getting a lot thinner and even a lot paler um and effectively weaker you know weaker looking so and sorry i can't think of all the artist names but please go and read the strings book it's brilliant absolutely brilliant you'll see it in any art gallery that the the women got thinner and thinner and paler and paler um so Strings really shows how the concept of whiteness was constructed and then how the concept of thinness as beauty paralleled it. So absolutely fascinating. And then what we've inherited is what Strings explains as a cultural understanding that fatness equals some sort of racial inferiority. And that, of course, is not conscious for most people nowadays, but that is what we have inherited um, aesthetically, culturally, socially, um, and almost everything in our culture kind of teaches us that or has taught us that. There are important changes happening, though. We can talk about them in a minute. But basically, fat phobia can be directly traced back to the slave trade. Um, and indeed, a review of the book by Strings that I read, the review is by Hannah Carlin. Carlin even suggests uh, that there's a link between white supremacy and what she calls thin supremacy. And that's pretty um, strong language. Yeah. Do, Strings... we talk about, do we talk about kind of what that means for white people who are fat? Indeed, indeed, absolutely. So Strings um, was interviewed on a podcast called Food Psych. Um, and she said, the reason for fat phobia affecting white women is because fat phobia is related to anti-blackness. If fatness is related to blackness, and if there was and if there was an entire movement in the United States where white people were trying doggedly to prove that they were white and not black, then it's very important for white women not to be fat. Right. So she's basically explaining that this is one of the reasons it's so important for white women to be thin, whether we know it or not. Mm. That's what we've inherited. Yeah. yeah. So um, we need to eventually got to get on to Ozempic, but the other thing we need to discuss before we get on to Ozempic is another kind of part of the history of fat phobia. 
and that is the history of the BMI. So BMI. Body, body mass index. Exactly, body mass index. So it's kind of everyone knows it. We've all heard it. We've all done the calculations, um, et cetera. It's really, really easy to do. And it's kind of accepted worldwide, even by the World Health Organization, as the gold standard for identifying obesity or identifying a healthy weight. Um, It's simple. It's weight divided by height squared. If the number you come up with is between about 19 and 25, then you're okay. If it's under 19, you might be underweight, likely. If you're over 25, you're overweight or even obese. Um, It must be good, right? World Health Authority, um, World Health Organization endorses it. But sadly, no. (laughs) The BMI also has racist origins and very, very sexist origins as well. It wasn't even devised by a medic. It was devised by a mathematician. And for a deep dive, I really recommend that people go to the brilliant uh, podcast called The Maintenance Phase. And their, their discussion about the BMI is really brilliant. They devote the entire hour to the history of the BMI. So go there, listen. That's what I did. Around 1830, a mathematician called Lambert Cutelet, a Belgian guy, wanted to find a a kind of formula to describe the ideal man. Why he wanted to do this, I'm not really sure. Okay. But he decided he needed to get the measurements of the ideal man. Um, And you can see that as soon as we start talking about the ideal man, and of course it was a white man, we're talking about Belgium in the 1830s. Um, As soon as we're talking about that, we're getting into eugenics. Right. So Cutelet measured European men, only European men, white men. And he found that those who fitted the ideal, and I'm guessing that this ideal was his aesthetic ideal, right? It must have been his aesthetic ideal. It wasn't based on anything else. Those who met the ideal did score between 19 and 25 on that height, what is it, weight squared height ratio business, whatever it is. Um, No idea why he wanted to do that. Maybe that's between him and his therapist. Um, Okay. (laughs) But, you know, Cutelet was his name, Belgian guy. He did that. Now, fast forward to the 1970s, and we've got a bunch of white male American doctors and dietitians who were looking for a tool to screen for obesity. And they basically reinvigorated this. They did Cutelet's research. They reinvigorated it. They did. They added in their own new research um, that was still incredibly problematic. They surveyed about 7,500 white, healthy men. Um, They had a couple of exceptions with some Japanese men and some Bantu men, but of course we're only hearing men here, Mm -hmm. right? And the BMI was born and it was taken up while very, very widely, and it's only become more and more widespread right up to the point where the WHO accepted it as a measurement. So basically, if what we need to do is screen for healthy weight, and that's even problematic in itself, right? Why does weight, is there any such thing as a healthy weight? You know, you can be any weight and healthy by every other standard, but the BMI might tell you that you're unhealthy, Mm. even though it doesn't affect anything uh, to do with your actual health, Mm. right? BMI might be 
about right for about 50% of people in the world. Mm. Um, it is famously wrong for athletes who often often come out as being overweight because of their muscle mass weight. Um, it is famously wrong for many uh, cis women who have a different sort of fat and who were never involved in in any of the uh, any of the groups that were helped to devise BMI. Uh, it is famously wrong for old people who in fact may be more healthy if they have a bit more body weight for many reasons, but one of them is kind of really mechanistic. Body fat helps you bounce, literally bounce if you fall over mm. and you're less likely to break, break bones. Mm. So, you know, um, doesn't work for old people and it is super wrong for children, mm. right? Because children tend to grow outwards and then upwards. So if you get a kid at any time other than that ideal, you know, moment where the outward kind of equals the upwards, the kid is likely to be overweight or underweight according to the BMI. Mm. So it doesn't work with children. Um, and it's wrong for many different ethnic groups. Really, really problematic. It tells us very little about a person's health. And yet a high BMI is seen almost as a disease in itself. You might say, I have high cholesterol, I have high blood pressure, or I have high BMI, right? And yet the BMI is no indication of anything the way that cholesterol or high bl blood pressure are. And BMI can actually be really bad for someone's health, right? BMI is particularly bad for probably for underweight people, but definitely for people who are designated overweight because of those people we know stop going to the doctor. They go to the doctor less because they don't want to be weighed and told they have to lose weight. Rocking up at the doctor with a virus or with pneumonia or even with a broken bone, you might be told this is because you're overweight and you have to lose weight, right? So no wonder people who score higher on the BMI um, go to the doctor less, and we know that that's true. And, of course, that then has a spiralling catch-22 effect where those people become sicker. Um, so basically what I'm saying is BMI is evil and we all need to abandon it, including the World Health Organization. And lots and lots of medics agree with me. Like being told as a healthy person who is fat that you are unacceptable because of this BMI number is going, to, you know, likely to do you more harm than good. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the sort of um, backlash to, body, you know, so-called body positivity um, that I've seen online mm. seems to be that you know hey there is a point where being overweight is unhealthy there's definitely a kind of pervasive understanding if it's you know maybe a, a bogus one that medically it's not good to be quote overweight yeah, I guess people I think just that, accept that people, you know, just think, oh, that's we do. Know. Yeah, we we just accept that that fat equals unhealthy, mm. and that is not a true equation. It's just not. And BMI is way too blunt a tool. And I guess what I'm questioning is, well, do we even need a tool to tell us whether someone's unhealthily overweight? If someone is unhealthily overweight, they'll have indications that show us. Yeah. You know, anyway, that's the BMI. Shall we finally um, get on to Ozempic? Yeah. It's the latest in a really long line of what we might call quick fixes to um, 
address, let's, let's call it what it is, it's a quick fix to address fat phobia, right? That's what it's become. It didn't start off as that. Um, it started off as uh, a drug to treat diabetes type 2. Its active ingredient is called semaglutide. And by the way, Ozempic is only a brand name, the way that Botox is a brand name for botulinum toxin. But whenever we're talking about botulinum toxin, we call it Botox. It's Ozempic has become the same. There are other uh, brand names. Wegovi is one. There are others. But Ozempic has become the kind of name for all of these semaglutide treatments. Um, so it was invented to manage blood, sh blood sugar levels in people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, like Botox, people noticed that um, in addition to its original intended purpose, it had some extra uh, side effects. And while Botox extra side effect was wrinkles didn't form or, or became uh, less, uh, semaglutide side effect was that it made people lose weight. Um, and it's now often referred to, even in medical articles, a couple of medical articles that I read, referred to in language such as it's become a celebrity slimming jab. So let's just think about that language, right? We've got celebrity there. So straight away, it's desirable. It's associated with beauty. It's not about weight loss. It's not about thinness or fatness. It's about slimming, which is much nicer. You know, slimming is just something lovely that slim people do. Yep. And it's not a disgusting injection that will have hideous side effects. It's just a jab. It's just a jab, you know. So it's now a celebrity slimming jab. We've got uh, now doctors, online pharmacies, um, I did a little uh, online kind of so-called consultation uh, to see whether I was eligible for Ozempic. And guess what, Carla? You're really eligible. Yeah, I can pay, I can pay, you know, about 90 pounds for one week of Ozempic. But then, of course, I actually need months and months and months of it. Um, and I am eligible uh, interestingly, even though my BMI is between 19 and 25, so, but, you know, I've got a feeling that the, you know, the website I went to, maybe there wasn't a real doctor there because the the answer uh, came back immediately that I was <laughs> eligible. So maybe, I mean, either Gosh. the doctor was just super fast, like super efficient, you know, but I did get that prescription. Yeah. Everyone yeah. is eligible. Yeah, look, it's democratic. It's capitalism. You can pay for it. You can have it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I did do that. Uh, not going to buy it, though. Uh, you can get it easily, easily, easily. And one of the things that this has contributed to is actually a shortfall of available uh, availability of the drug for people with diabetes type 2 who actually really need it. Uh, this is documented in the UK and in, in the US. Let's just go backwards from that celebrity slimming jab, which really sounds rather charming, uh, and talk about some of the side effects. Yep. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, constipation, stomachache, abdominal pain, fatigue, injection site reactions. These are the more normal side effects that you can actually probably expect. But in addition to these, you can get vision changes, kidney problems, gallbladder disease, severe allergic reactions, an increased risk of thyroid cancer, low blood sugar, also known as, as hypoglycemia, and inflammation of the pancreas, also known as pancreatitis. So, you know... Awesome. But it is just a celebrity slimming jab. Okay. So, and it is a celebrity slim, slimming jab. Everyone, it seems, in Hollywood, on Instagram, all over the place, in popular culture, everyone shrank last year. Or is it shrunk? Everyone right. shrunk. Shrank or shrunk. Yeah. 
And Jimmy Kimmel mentioned Ozempic in his uh, hosting of the most recent uh, Academy Awards. Um, it's often comedians who come out first about these things. So remember um, good old Joan Rivers, you know, one of the first people to talk publicly about her own cosmetic surgery. Um, and Kathy Griffin as well, one of the first people to really talk about uh, cosmetic surgery. It's often celebrity, uh, so often comedians who come out first, and that's the case at the moment. We've got um, Amy Schumer came out about having used Ozempic, saying how sick it made her, how um, she lost all her energy, she couldn't play with her son, she was so sick. Um, Tracy Morgan, the famous Tracy Morgan, has said he'll never, ever give up his Ozempic because, you know, it's changed his life and he's only got half his appetite now. And and he says he only eats half a bag of Doritos now, not not the full bag. Yeah. So, you know, non-comedians, Elon Musk has admitted to using it. Uh, Sharon Osbourne said on a British talk show uh, earlier this year, of her own Ozempic journey. Uh, for me, the first few weeks was fucking shit because you just throw up all the time. You feel so nauseous. After a couple of weeks, it goes. I was very sick for a couple of months. The first couple of months, I just felt nauseous. Every day I felt nauseous. My stomach was upset, whatever. It occurred to me, you know, hearing her say that, that it's a kind of medically sanctioned bulimia like it's what she's describing is kind of just spewing up all the time anyway I know it's very different to bulimia bulimia is an illness um but, but are they know, are people eating like it, and then they feel sick or are they just nauseous and so they don't eat both yeah so it's kind of similar to either anorexia or bulimia it's an ideal combination. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm, mm, yep. We've also got um, people like um, Golnessa, or her nickname is Gigi, Golnessa Garachadagi, and she's an influencer uh, reality TV show, really quite interesting. She's she's small fish in terms of the influencer, um, you know, pond. She only has just under a million followers on Instagram. So, you know, we're not talking about Kim Kardashian here, but she's still got a huge amount of people there. And what she says, or what she said was this, when I started semaglutide shots, I was 138 pounds. Now I'm about 110 pounds. As you can see, I've lost a lot more. I've lost a little more weight than I was anticipating to lose. I decided I'm only going to weigh myself on the days of my injections just to document it. And on April 30, I got on the scale and saw 111 pounds. That's when I knew it's time to cut back. That's when I started cutting down on units and going backwards and backwards until finally now I'm just on maintenance. Will I come off it? Maybe. Will I gain it all back? Maybe. But for now, I'm enjoying the way I look. I'm enjoying what it's doing for me. I encourage it to anybody who's having a hard time losing weight and wants the easy route. Summer's around the corner. I'm not trying to stress that being skinny is what you should do, but truth is some of y'all want to do it. So I'm talking to you guys, not the haters. To the haters, kiss my ribs, bitches. Right? Mm. So it's this extraordinary uh, sort of post-feminist, I will do what I want to do, it's my body, um, I will take control. I have control. I can go up, down, roundabout, um, and I will promote it with these little caveats of you don't have to be skinny, you know, but if you want to be, this is a thing mm -hmm. you can do. Yeah. Um, and that then brings us to something the Beauty Chronicles is quite interested in, which is faces and the so-called Ozempic face. Mm -hmm. 
So this term, the Ozempic face, was termed probably by Paul Jared Frank, who is a kind of celebrity dermatologist, cosmetic surgeon um, based in New York City, the Hamptons and Miami. I'm surprised he doesn't have an office in LA, but he probably does. And I've just just missed it. He calls it the Ozempic face. And it's not something, the term wasn't invented in order to say, don't take Ozempic because you'll end up looking like this, right? It was in, invented as another thing that you need treatment for, right? So after you've taken your Ozempic or during your Ozempic maintenance phase, um, you may well find that uh, you have more lines and wrinkles. Your skin on your face is loose and baggy. Your jowls begin to kind of hang down and you might have a sort of hollowed out appearance. Uh, and this is basically what happens to anyone who's lo who loses a lot of weight fast is you lose the, your skin doesn't have the time to develop enough elasticity and collagen to actually deal with that. You're, you're left with skin that would cover fat and the fat is no longer there. So the skin kind of, kind of hangs down a bit like an empty balloon. And that is ozempic face. But of course, that can be fixed with fillers, with, um, with cosmetic surgery, with little implants, cheek implants, chin implants, all the rest of it. So, um, so that is the ozempic face. Um, and a, you know, a kind of new status symbol, you know, you've got the skinny, skinny, skinny body created by maybe by ozempic allegedly, allegedly, as Kathy Griffin says. Um, and then you've got the, um, face that is filled and plumped with things that you've paid for. And all of these are status symbols available to the richest of us. I'm just sort of Googling a Zempic face mm. to see what it looks like pre-treatment, pre-filler. Mm. Well, like, it's kind of hard to find examples. Like I'm curious about whether it um, – looks like the kind of face you get if you take too much crystal meth. But it's well, that's really interesting because it is similar to that. And somehow it, it is more hollowed out. Um, it's also been likened to the kind of HIV cocktail face, an early HIV cocktail face. Yeah. And it can result in an actual condition, so a Zempic can result in an actual condition called lipodystrophy, which some people on, especially on earlier combinations of the HIV drugs developed, and lipodystrophy is a, dis, is a redistribution of fat. So one of the lipodystrophy kind of symptoms is a hump of fat on your back, extra fat in your belly or around your belly, but a real loss of fat in the face. In the face. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yes, it can, it can result in lipodystrophy, which, yeah, can, has a kind of distinct look. Very, very sharp cheek, cheekbones. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I guess in terms of, the Kardashians specifically, what has prompted, like culturally what's gone on to kind of make people want to be thin again? Like I kind of feel like thin has always yeah. been preferable I for don't the reasons think, you talk yeah. about fat phobia to begin with, but kind of yeah. why are we no longer in this sort of body positivity phase? Thinness never, never left. Fat phobia never left, but we have been through a phase over the last decade or so where um, fat phobia became far less acceptable. Um, for me, the one of and that was that's obviously partly to do with the Kardashians. They 
definitely early on glorified a more curvaceous body that had more fat. Um, and, and I'll talk in a minute about maybe the reasons that that's, that's changed. There's been a backlash against that and they've led that backlash in some ways. But if we think about a decade ago, you know, where they, or 15 years ago even, where they were at their height in terms of modelling bodies that weren't thin. And a show like Absolutely Fabulous, which is about white women, right? If you look at Absolutely Fabulous now, every second joke is fat phobic, right? Adina is not even fat, but all the jokes are about her being fat. If you look at Absolutely Fabulous now, you could not make a mm -hmm. show now with those sorts of jokes. So we have moved on. Definitely fat, definitely fat phobia is beginning to change, right? I'm, I think it's still absolutely the dominant narrative around bo body size, but it is beginning to change and we can work to keep on making it change. A real instant, while we couldn't make a show like Absolutely Fabulous anymore, a real instance of fat phobia at work were the memes and comments around Donald Trump's mugshot because that mugshot included his height and weight. And I don't know, you know, if you work out his BMI, maybe he's overweight or something. But there were lots of comments about him being, Basically, he was fat shamed online, and people's fat phobia. And I thought really that was also out. kind of weird because the, the things I saw were sort of mocking him because he was claiming to have the same weight and height as, you know, professional athletes. But I was like, you can still have that body weight and not have the physique of a professional athlete. Like it seemed an odd way to mock him. It was a lazy way to mock him. You know, to go into fat phobia was a really lazy way to mock him. We should mock him, you yeah, know. But not for I his mean, body we should type. ignore him, actually, but, you know. Exactly. And, you know, there was a meme that I saw that said, just a reminder, inmate P01135809 will not see your fat shaming memes, but your fat friends will. So, you know, let's let's just keep that in mind. This led me to do, to look up fat phobia and to look up the kind of um you know, think about ways that we can train ourselves to be not fat phobic because it's extremely embedded. You know, from the moment we're aware we have bodies. Um there are little tests you can do to check out whether you are fat phobic or not. I did two of them. I did one that was more of a, a kind of popular one and it showed that, oh, I'm a, f congratulations, Meredith, you're a, you're a fat ally. Yeah, so I did well on that one. Um, but then I did a more complicated one that's um, called, it's, it's part of a har set of har Harvard they're called implicit association tests, the IATs, the Harvard IATs. And they basically will give you a measurement uh, on all sorts of uh, biases that that we might have as a and then it'll compare your measurement to the to the average. And they're pretty interesting. So I did the one around fat phobia, and it told me that during the implicit association test, your responses, suggested a slight automatic preference for thin people over fat people. Is this the weight IAT? Yes. Okay. So it don't okay. you can't do it now. It takes an hour. Yeah. So even though I was trying to do that, you know, really with fat positivity in mind, and I still got a slight automatic preference for thin people over fat people. So it's just really, I'm not saying it's any, you know, means anything really at all, but it's interesting for us to do as individuals um, and to think about those memes, for example, around Trump, to think about fat shaming, why we do it, who we do it to, how we should stop doing it, even to the most evil people. Their mm -hmm. fatness is nothing to do with them being evil. 
Trump's fatness is nothing to do with him as a politician. And, you know, I think we have moved on. We do have people like Lizzo, for example, who are not just fat positive, they're fat beautiful, you know, that that they're role models, you know, people want to look like Lizzo. Um, but most of us don't. Most of us will champion someone like Lizzo, say she's great, love her, et cetera, et cetera. But oh no, 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 no. Um, actually I'm still counting my calories, uh, going on a long walk, et cetera, et cetera. It's so embedded. And really, you know, to answer your question, I think that we we had a kind of decade. Uh, of Kardashians, of of Ka- Kardashians in their previous incarnations, of um, Obama being the president of the United States, of black and fat bodies being more visible in more positive ways, and that hasn't completely gone at all. The legacy we we have a legacy of that but we are currently seeing a backlash and the the Kardashians are kind of not leading it, but they're sitting on that wave, you know, they're sitting on that wave of a new thinness, a new whiteness, um, a kind of revision back to the dominant narrative around thin, white, beauty, is the best. I want to try and retrain myself to not just be able to say fat people are beautiful, but to be able to actually feel that for myself be able to take the Harvard IAT and ace it, get like come out on top. But genuinely, not not by cheating. <laughs> <laughs> not because you, you're trying to guess the right answer. Yes, exactly. Yeah.